Hello everyone. In the previous video, you saw me talking about Kalman filter and I tried to explain as much as possible in that 80 something minute video. So you learned that Kalman filter has some limitations. The first one and the foremost was it is limited to linear systems. So if the observation model or the state transition model any of them is nonlinear, then Kalman filter is not going to do a great job. And that is when you need to use alternatives, and one of them is called extended Kalman filter, which is the version of the Kalman filter you can use for a nonlinear system, which will be linearized. Now, before I go into details of that, I want to show you here this uh, second demo I made. That's the same pendulum as in my previous video, but the only difference is I made the um, uh, initial condition here, instead of uh, 6 degrees, this is 3 pi over 4. So this is 135 degrees. Clearly in this range, sine cannot be approximated by x, sine of x, and definitely the governing equations are nonlinear. And in this case, if I use the Kalman filter that I showed you last time, right, and I use the same initial condition, the same covariance and everything, except I try to use ABC for a linearized version of the system, if I run this, you're going to see that the uh, Kalman filter is not going to do a good job in uh, basically estimating the states of the system, theta and theta dot here, okay? And that's because, again, the system is nonlinear here. So that's where we try to resort to the extended Kalman filter. So let's take a look here. This is your theta dot, if you want to see that. Now, for theta dot, there is no direct measurement. So here, the actual data without noise, because, again, we, there is no measurement for it, is the blue curve, which is almost on... Uh, overlapping with the red curve, and red curve is the extended Kalman filter, which you see doing an amazing job, and the yellow is the regular Kalman filter, which you see does not capture the amplitude, and it clearly does not capture the phase. It kind of captures the frequency, but that's it. Okay, so clearly you see extended Kalman filter can do a great job, but not the regular Kalman filter, and if you look at theta, you see a similar behavior here. Right, again here, the Kalman filter regular is the red one. The actual data is yellow, which is uh, almost on the top of green, and green is the extended one, and the measured data with noise is the blue. So if I zoom into a portion of it, maybe you can see it better. There we go. You see here, yellow versus blue versus green, and you see green is doing a relatively good job here. And the reason you see this step type behavior is because of the zero, all, uh, zero order hold uh, block that I'm going to explain. But clearly you see that I'm doing a, a much, much greater job with extended Kalman filter as compared to what the uh, regular Kalman filter. So what is the extended Kalman filter? Let's go ahead and talk about it. So here we assume that the functions we have is f for state transition. So x of k is f of instead of a times x plus b times u, is f of any function, any nonlinear function or linear function of xk minus 1 and uk minus 1, plus, of course, the process noise. And z is, again, being instead of c times xk, is a function h of xk plus, again, the measurement noise vk, where wk and vk are Gaussian with mean of 0 and with the covariance of q and r. So here, the prediction and the correction steps are exactly like Kalman filter, no difference. If you look at the uh, gain, you see that it is the uh, P. Remember here, as I said, compared to the previous video, in previous video, I had mu hat K, which was for prediction. Here, it is uh, what? It is X hat of K given K minus what? one okay so this is this one and the covariance matrix that was sigma bar of k here is p of k given k minus one and similarly in the uh, update x hat of k given k is what's back there we call just mu k and p of k given k is that sigma of k none of them with the bar 
Okay, so that's the same uh, notation, and you see that the Kalman gain is the covariance matrix times H, so we need to define H, times S inverse, where S is H times P times H transpose plus R. R is the same as before, right? Q is the same as before, right? P is the same as before, everything. The two new things that we have, one of them is this H guy, the other one is what? This F that we have in the prediction. You see P of K given K minus 1 is F times P of K minus 1 given K of minus 1 times F K transpose plus Q of K minus 1. So what is F? What is H? These are the Jacobians of the F function for the state transition and the H function for what? For the observation model. So these Jacobians, partial of f with respect to x and partial of h with respect to x, right? They calculated at x and u and xk minus 1. These guys are, and here, if this is uk minus 1, this also should be uk minus 1. Unless that is uk and this is uk. And actually, uh, uh, this, these two have to be the same thing. So clearly, you see that this is a linearized version of the system. So this f is approximated by its uh, f at the uh, initial value, whatever it is, plus what? It's partial of f with respect to x times what? Times basically dx, right? So clearly, that is this f here. Right, and this one is approximated by its uh, value at the initial point plus partial of h with respect to x dx. Correct, and that guy here is what that is your h function here. So, as long as you linearize the system and find these Jacobians, then you can what you can use the same equations as the Kalman filter for both prediction and correction. Now, uh, you can either calculate these uh, Jacobians analytically or in the EKF block in MATLAB, it allows you to calculate them numerically, okay, using a finite difference formula or so. So you have both options here, and I'm going to talk about it. Now, one important thing is, as I said, the extended Kalman filter is the nonlinear version of the regular Kalman filter which operates by linearizing the system about the current mean and the current covariance. If the models are well-defined, the F and H function, which means they don't have severe nonlinearity and they can easily be differentiable, so we can easily calculate the Jacobians, EKF actually has been de facto standard in theory of nonlinear state estimation. So as long as F and H can easily be differentiated and we get capital F and capital H, okay, and the uh, probability distributions are still Gaussian, right? These probabilities, as you can see, these are Gaussian. The probability of the initial state is Gaussian and so on. So the posterior is uh, Gaussian. Then uh, the EKF is doing a good job, as you can see. But... Does it have limitations? Sure. What are they? Unlike Kalman filter, extended Kalman filter is not optimal. It works relatively fine for nearly optimal systems. So it's not necessarily going to minimize that what? That x of t minus x hat of t right summation t goes from 1 to n or uh, 0 to n okay so it's not going to necessarily minimize it to its global minimum because you are only linear uh, only working with the linearized version of the system not the actual system okay so that's the first thing it's nearly optimal not perfectly optimal second thing if the initial estimates of the states of the system are wrong then this model will diverge because it's a linearized version or if the process model is not correct. So if the initial value for this x or this p is wrong or if the models for f or h 
are not perfect. There is some unmodeled dynamics or unmodeled sensor dynamics. Guess what? This model has a chance of diverging. Three, the covariance that you estimate, this P matrix, typically tends to what? Underestimate the actual covariance matrix. When it underestimates that, what does it mean? It means this P is going to be smaller than what it is. And when P is small, means what? Means your um, basically model does have a small uncertainty. So you're going to rely big time on your model and smaller on your sensor. Remember here that the K, when we went here in this uh, equation, when we multiply this Y tilde K, the innovation term by uh, the gain, this gain does depend on what? Does depend on this P. And here, clearly, you see if P drops, K drops. When K drops, the effect of innovation is small. So you mostly rely on your model. And that could be dangerous because you are literally discarding or not paying enough attention to your sensor measurements. And so that can have the uh, effect of not really removing too much of the noise and not really stabilizing the noise. So you are not going to get consistent results and any good results. The next thing is the Gaussian assumptions. Still, the EKF has the Gaussian assumptions, although it can uh, deal with nonlinear functions, but still it has Gaussian assumptions. And as I told you in previous video, in many applications like localizations, like object tracking and so on, you better use a multimodal distribution, right? Or estimate the distribution, as we'll see in Kalman filter or in unscented, uh, unscented Kalman filter or particle filters. And a Gaussian assumption can be violated. And finally, uh, you need to do a bunch of differentiations here in these equations 12 and 13. And sometimes this differentiation could be what? not easily doable. Although they have derivatives, they are not necessarily easy to calculate. Plus, these calculations add a lot to your computations. So although EKF here is still computationally efficient, but EKF, the computations for it, are clearly bigger than what? bigger than the computations of a regular Kalman filter, although still manageable and still you can use EKF, but you have to calculate all of these derivatives many times in real time, and you don't have those functions easily available to you to analytically find them. So let's go ahead and see how I implemented the extended Kalman filter. Well, all you need to do is to bring the extended Kalman filter block. So you click anywhere and say what? Extended Kalman filter, you see? And it gives you this block. And this block, all it needs is it needs a function that you provide to define the state transition. It needs the noisy measurement. And inside of it, there is another function that you need, which is the observation model. And of course, uh, you can, as I said, talk about Jacobian. So let's go ahead and see what I have in um, this extended Kalman filter. So if you double click on it, you see here uh, you have a place that you can provide the function that describes the state transition, that F function. And uh, you can do it with either simulink block, simulink function, sorry, or um, with an M file, and here I have done it with M file. So here is my M file. It is stored in the same folder as the simulink. So here I have the length of the pendulum, the mass of the pendulum, G, and the sample time, just like my previous um, demo file. And here are the two first order ODEs coming from the uh, actual second order ODE. And here I use the Euler's method approximation. To discretize these equations because that's how uh, EKF works. It works on discrete systems. So uh, the new x1 is going to be the old x1, and here x1 is the same as theta plus uh, x2, of course, or theta dot times dt. 
and the new uh, x2 dot, which is the new theta dot, the new, sorry, x, uh, x dot 2 or the new theta dot, that's right, equals the old uh, uh, theta dot, right, or the old x2, plus the right-hand side, which is basically the torque divided by ml squared plus or negative and uh, plus negative gl sine of theta so you see all of that uh, right hand side here is multiplied by dt and if you look here uh, this is that uh, these two equations together combined as a vector so here when we say x here x is a vector and it has two components theta and theta dot or x1 and x2 so you see x new is x old plus the first component will be added to it x2 times dt. You see dt is multiplied by the whole bracket. And the second one is that negative g sine of theta over L plus tau over or u over ml squared, the whole thing times dt. So this is what, this is the f function, but in terms of two first order of these. Okay, so that is my m file that I have. And uh, you see the type of noise that now I have for this is an additive noise. And for the Jacobian of that, the capital F, if I check this, now I have to provide the name of the function that analytically gives me the Jacobian. If I don't check it and it gives me an external port for that, or, at least, or I can provide, as I said, the name, if I uncheck it, then it does it numerically. And this is what I want. And numerically is fine with me here. The covariance here is a covariance matrix, and here we go with diagonal of 0 and 0 0.002. Remember, this 0 0.002 was the process covariance that we have. Uh, one thing I need to emphasize here, and uh, it was a, a small mistake in my previous demo, was in my previous demo for this part, for the Q tab, right, if I go back and show you uh, here, for the Q tab, the mistake that I had in my previous video, and I corrected it, I added the subtitle for it. But here for the Q, I just typed in 0 0.002. It should be a matrix. It should be a matrix because your state is two by uh, is two by one, so your covariance matrix is two by two. Now you might say, why didn't you put that 0, 0, 002 for both diagonal elements? Why did you just put it for the second element for X dot? The reason is in these equations, if you look, the um, epsilon is showing itself here. We assume that it is only really, it's a process noise. And so basically the only place that it will add itself is right here as an extra component that will affect my angular acceleration here. Okay, so it is really since it's a process noise, it's like another input, another torque into the system. This is the torque of gravity. This is directly the external torque. So if we add it here as an external component, right, that process noise, then clearly it only affects x2 dots, right, or the second component of vector x, not the first component. That's why here we only added what? We only added that 0 0.002 to second element. And that is very important that we did not also add it to what? To the first element. So here I wanted to mention that and mention that I fixed that in the simulink demo file and I uh, uh, uploaded the file. Now here, as I said, the angle is 135 uh, and zero velocity. So I used the same initial states that I had in the pendulum. And uh, if you remember, I told you that for this uh, sigma zero, right, for this guy, don't put zero on the diagonals, even though you know the initial angle and initial velocity very perfectly. If you just go with four zeros here, you are going to get an error. So use very small numbers, as you see I used for the diagonals, like 10 to the negative 8 or something, or 6. And uh, then, of course, again, you need your edge function, the observation. And here, the observation is only theta. So as you can see, my observation function here is simply what? Y equal X of 1. Or another way to do it is to say Y equals what? 1 and uh, 0 times vector X. 
That's another way to say it's just the first element or the theta. So here are the two functions that I have. And again, Jacobian of H, which is capital H, is uh, calculated numerically. As I said, you can add a port for it. Okay, but we don't want that. The noise is additive. The R is 0 0.001. Okay, so you see all of them are there. Now, if you have uh, one extra sensor, the only sensor here I have is an encoder for measuring the angle. If you have any other sensor, you can click on this guy and say add a measurement. And now you can have more than one sensor. Right? You see? So that is sensor fusion. You can do more than one sensor. Here you have two measurements now. If I just OK that and I go back to my uh, Simulink, link, you see now you have two ports for measurements, Y1 and Y2. Here, Y1 is only what? The angle of me the angular me the angle measurement. If I wanted to have a way to, like a tachometer, to measure theta dot, I can add that here as well, right? I can have sensor fusion. And another interesting thing about sensor fusion that I mentioned is your sensors could have different sample rates. Can you have that here? Absolutely. If you look here, this is the default sample rate for all of your sensors, but if you want, you can have them to be different. So you come here under this multi-rate tab, and here you can say, hey, enable multi-rate, and then for measurement one and measurement two, you can have what? Different sample rates. You see? So you can have different sample rates. This is very good when you're working with IMU and GPS. This guy can do the job for you. Okay, so once you have all this information, now here I don't have measurement two, so I just remove it. But once you have all of this stuff in, inside the block you are good. So what should you connect to it? The bottom port is your measurement, which you connected directly to the angle. What is the top port going to be? The top port is for your transition uh, function. What does your transition function need? If you go back and look, your transition function need x and u. X is the state, so it is already developed and uh, it's available inside the extended Kalman uh, filter function. So X does not need to be provided externally, but U, the input, is something you need to provide. And in this case, I need to what? I need to connect it directly to what? To the external torque, which in this case I set it to zero, but if you want, you can make it non-zero. And the other thing is, this extended Kalman filter only works with discretized systems. So these signals, you have to use this block called zero order hold, which is basically a sampling. And you see the sample rate for them is the same as everywhere else, 0 0.01. And use these guys on the way of U and Y, so they provide discrete uh, data to the EKF, so EKF can work. Okay, and here not only I have EKF, I have the regular KF, right? And again, we can compare their estimates of this nonlinear watt pendulum here. So, I guess I explained all of these items for you that uh, we, we need to use zero order hold, we need to use small values for the covariance of the initial state. We can do numeric or analytic Jacobian, and if you have more than one sensor, we can add them and we can use multi-rate to provide different sample rates. So now that everything is available, the CMU link along with the two M files, again, I go ahead and run my uh, CMU link for you one more time so you see it. And I'm going to see with you the theta and the theta dot from both regular Kalman filter and extended. Kalman filter, and as you saw last time, and we're going to see it again, extended Kalman filter is doing an amazing job, but the regular Kalman filter does not here. Look, the actual data is the yellow, which is right under green. The noisy data is blue. The uh, a regular Kalman filter does not capture the phase, does not capture the amplitude, barely the frequency. The extended Kalman filter, though, does an amazing job. You see it's almost at the top of the yellow curve. Look here. And again, this step type behavior that you see in the extended Kalman filter is because of those zero order hold blocks. 
So you see that it is doing what? An amazing job here. And if I look at this one also, you see that it also captures theta dot pretty well, but the regular one does not. So I'm going to upload this along with the two M files, and hopefully you can download and learn from it, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.